All right, let's let's uh, let's go ahead and we will get started. Ah, oh, God is good. I'm really excited. There's so much to talk about. So uh, grab your coffee and let's uh, let's get ready to study. Lord, you are good. We thank you that you are always, always faithful. We love you and praise you in Yeshua's name. We pray. Amen. All right, well, if you've been paying attention, you know that everybody else... Uh, this weekend is celebrating the um, Good Friday and tomorrow the Easter. How did we get here, right? Uh, w- why are we here on Saturday and everybody else goes on Sunday? Right? So the, some of these, some of the questions we're going to talk about, and this is really a, a bigger topic. All right, we're going to talk about stolen identity and how Marcion twisted Paul's teachings and stole our kingdom identity. Now, probably a lot of you are like, who? There's this guy named Marcion. All right, I'm going to get into him. All right, but this is relevant because, well, the rest, most of Christianity is celebrating Easter, right? There, that word is a problem. Um, they're celebrating at a different time, and you know, on every week, they're celebrating on a different day. So what gives, right? I mean, we're all pretty convinced that the Lord didn't do away with his Sabbath. He didn't do away with the Torah. So what happened? Well, turns out there's this dude named Marcion. And, well, Marcion was not a good guy. All right? Marcion uh, was a heretic in the second century. He uh, was declared a heretic about 144 A.D., and uh, some of the church fathers had some really nice things to say about him, such as um, he was called a ravening wolf, a filthy swine, a dreadful blasphemer. And about 150 A.D., his heresies had spread to the whole human race, according to Justin Martyr. Uh, Tertullian said that Marcion's heretical tradition has filled the whole earth. And most of us have never heard of this guy. All right, so uh, I, I kind of think of it like him haunting our theology. You know, he's kind of done some things that like, well, you know, not so great. Um, and, and what's so crazy is that a lot of people have never heard of this guy, and yet his theology has permeated our theology in general. It's crazy to think about it, all right? So he really stole our identity. All right, so if you look there, it says uh, Jesus nailed the old or the old law to the cross. Now that just makes me cringe a little bit, okay, because, well, it's not true. And I just want to say that I'm going to be talking about some other teachers out there today. And I am not going to say in any way, shape, or form uh, that they're not believers. I think they are believers, Okay, the people that I'm quoting, I think, love Jesus. I really do. All right, I'm just, I'm just suggesting that maybe their theology is off. Okay, I think you can have bad theology and still love Jesus. All right, so let's just be really clear about that. All right, so we're not, we're not suggesting that people don't love the Lord or something. We're just suggesting that maybe the, what they're teaching here is off. Okay, so uh, he says, so this is from uh, biblicalproof.wordpress.com. For example, conclusively, positively, without any doubt, the entire law of Moses, a.k.a. the law of God, the Ten Commandments, including the Sabbath, was abolished, passed away, and cast out. Ooh, I mean, this is like fingers on the chalkboard. Remember those chalkboards? Like, okay. Um, I'm like, ah, yeah, that's not, that's not what happened. All right. You can see there, there's another meme, and... uh, it just makes me a little bit, it raises my blood pressure, to be clear. All right, now, um, this is a, a comment I got from a woman some years ago. Uh, this was on Facebook, as you can see. And she says, I am a Gentile, so Paul is my apostle. The law of the Old Testament and the four Gospels don't apply to me. Okay, I don't worship on Saturdays. I don't slaughter lambs. Little spelling mistake. And when I sin, I am free to obey the Lord because of love, not law. Oh my goodness. There's so much wrong with that statement. And yet, here's a woman. I, I, I'm sure that she does love the Lord. I have no doubt about it. 
And, and she's, I'm sure, she, well, probably she's saved, okay? I mean, the Lord's the judge. But she probably really did put her faith in the Lord, and she has a, a relationship with Jesus, okay? So I'm not questioning whether she has a relationship with Jesus. I'm just say, suggesting that maybe what she's been taught about Paul is messed up. And how did it get there? Well, this dude named Marcion, okay? He's pretty much the culprit. And his theology has permeated the general Western theology. You can hear, I'm going to show you some examples of how it is being taught today at Dallas Theological Seminary. Now, the reason that I want to talk about this is because we're going to get into the book of Romans. And in order to understand Romans, you've got to know a little bit about Paul. To know about something about Paul, we have to know how Paul has been taught for the last 2,000 years, by and large. And so, by and large, it's this Marcionistic version of Paul that has been taught. Now, what's interesting is when you get into Messianic Hebrew roots, um, Thomas and I were talking about this on the chairlift uh, on Thursday. It was quite fun at Vail. We had a great time. Thank you for that. Um, and so people were watching uh, Prophecy Roundtable were debating, is Doug's lighting bad or has he just got a sunburn? I had a sunburn, okay? Uh, it, was a, it was an amazing day, so thank you, Thomas. Um, but... Um, God's commandments are good, all right? And so what happened is this guy named Marcion, he came and he started twisting Paul so that Paul supposedly is saying things that seem very contradictory to what we see in the rest of the Bible. And so this is why you have these statements saying that Paul is my apostle. Uh, this, is, this is what many, many people actually hold to. Uh, so we see that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my, my mitzvot, mitzvotai, my statutes, and my laws. Okay, Genesis 26, 5. So Abraham, before the law was given, so to speak, at Mount Sinai, Abraham, roughly 600 years before Mount Sinai, was already keeping God's laws. Do you know why? Because God's laws are simply his values. They're just the values. Uh, if you had kids, you probably had some house rules. Those reflected your values. And if you were a pretty good parent, they're probably pretty good rules. Okay? You weren't perfect. Nobody's perfect. But, you know, you wanted the best for your kids, so you had some house rules. And those are there for a reason. There's a sign by the pool that says no running, not because they're trying to take all the fun out of life, because they know that people that run by a pool tend to fall by a pool, and then they crack their head open. My kid did that. All right? So God's commandments are good. They're not evil. They're not bad. Uh, Numbers 36, the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. Who gave the commandments to Moses? God. God gave the commandments. This is why we think the commandments are pretty cool. Because it was God. Oh, and we talked about how Jesus is God, right? So it was Jesus who gave the commandments to Moses. They're not Moses' laws. They're God's laws. Or in other words, Jesus' laws. Okay? So we're not suggesting that they're different at all. He says in Jeremiah 31 concerning the new covenant that he's going to put his law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy them, but to fulfill them, Jesus says. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Right? So we have so much proof that God's laws are good. Uh, in uh, Ecclesiastes, well, it's actually in First John, he who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments as a liar, and the truth is not in him, this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the same thing that Solomon said in Ecclesiastes. He said, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. So it almost sounds like John 
and Solomon are saying the same thing. Just keep God's commandments. Keeping the commandments of God is what matters. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 7.19. Paul also says in Romans 3.31, do we then abolish the law by this faith? Of course not. Instead, we uphold the law. The law was not done away with. But many people who've been taught about Paul have not learned about Paul, but they've learned about the Marcionistic version of Paul. Some years ago, I did a debate uh, with a man who was a Torah keeper, and yet he said, I don't like Paul. And so he wanted to show that Paul was a false, uh, a false prophet, a false apostle. And he was surprised that I was keeping Torah. He's like, wait, why are you keeping Torah? I'm like, because uh, that's what the Bible says to do. But Paul is good. He's not bad. You see, the problem is, is in misunderstanding Paul. Because what many people in the church at large teach about Paul is not what Paul is saying. It's this Marcionistic version of Paul that they're giving us. And so that's what we want to stay away from. This is from uh, Tertullian. He's one of the early church fathers. He says the separation of law and gospel is the primary and principal exploit of Marcion. And to show the conflict and disagreement of the law or the gospel and the law, this separation of law and gospel, which has suggested a God of the gospel other than and in opposition to the God of the law. All right, so Marcion was teaching that the Old Testament God was different than the New Testament God. Ooh, that's not good, is it? He's teaching that the Old Testament God is different than the New Testament God. Now, you will not meet any believer today who thinks that there are two different gods. No, no, no. However, they will act as if the God of the Old Testament really had a very different, kind of a different MO. You know, he was doing a different thing. Well, that was God back then. That was the Old Testament, right? You know, that, that's how God used to be. Uh, the dispensationalists call it dispensationalism. Like, well, God acted that way back then, but now he acts this way. God was much more into law, but now he's really into grace, you know? Like he turned over a new leaf somehow. Yeah, I used to be really harsh, but then I decided to be nice. I mean, that's not God at all. That's not how he works. Uh, Tertullian goes on to say about Marcion that he displayed a hatred against the Jews' most solemn day, Sabbath. He was only professedly following the Creator as being his Christ in his very hatred of the Sabbath. So, again, one of the reasons that most of the church is against the idea of the Sabbath is because of Marcion. But they don't know about Marcion. They've never heard of this guy. But they think that Paul was teaching that. It's almost like our theology has been haunted. You know, a haunted house. You know there's something wrong with the house, but you can't see what. At least in the movies, right? But there's something in there. There's something in our theology that isn't right. And so really what happened is that Marcion stole our identity. We are part of the kingdom of God. We're part of this renewed covenant where God's putting the two houses back together. That entire identity has been stolen from us so that we have no real concept of that at all. Irenaeus, another church father, he says the Lord did not abrogate the law his teachings do not contain or imply an opposition to and an overturning of the precepts of the past as Marcion's followers do strenuously maintain, but a fulfilling and an extension of them. Isn't that incredible? The early church fathers understood it, and yet Marcion's teachings were so pervasive that his teachings became confused and conflated with Christianity itself. So that many times when people said Christian, they're like, oh, you're a Marcionist. You're a Marcionite. Like, oh, no, no, no. I really believe in all the whole Bible. 
right? But it's almost like saying, you know, if almost like if Mormonism had be, would become the, the basic version of Christianity, we'd be like, wait, that's not right, right? And yet this is what happened with Marcion. His teachings were so pervasive. Jerome, uh, writing to Augustine, he says, I say these things, not that I may, like Machanaeus and Marcion, destroy the law, which I know to be the test, uh, to which I know to be on the testimony of the apostle Paul, to be both holy and spiritual. Paul says in Romans, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. So who messed it up? Marcion. He's the bad guy here. He's the one that really did some bad stuff. And so in uh, in part of Marcion's Marcion's antithesis, the law versus faith. You ever heard this sermon? I've heard this sermon many times. That the law was somehow against faith, or law was against grace, right? You have these different ideas. Marcion expounded his main position in a work called Antitheses, that the God of the New Testament was the God of grace who offered salvation to all by faith alone. And... Uh, where we told after Simon Magus, it was Marcion above all whom the fathers regarded as the arch heretic. The law is discarded and salvation depends on faith alone. I've heard this sermon many times. I'll tell you, when I stumbled across Marcion, I'm like, oh my goodness. This is the guy that corrupted our theology. This is the guy whose ghost kind of lives on in our theology and yet none of us have ever heard of Marcion. For the gospel of the free grace of God and salvation by faith alone had been substituted by the 12 apostles in their gospel, so Marcion believed by a legalism of a genuinely Jewish character. Uh, according to Angela Tilby, heresies and how to avoid them. For Marcion, there was a fundamental contradiction between law and love, righteousness, and grace. Man, I've heard this sermon many times from people who love the Lord, from people who mean so well, and yet they've been teaching some bad stuff. Now again, I'm going to share with you some teachings of some more modern people. I'm not saying that they didn't love the Lord. I'm going to talk about uh, John Nelson Darby. Did he love the Lord? I don't know. Maybe he did. I'm gonna, let's give him the benefit of the doubt, okay? But what he taught in regards to Paul and the law and many things was off. John Nelson Darby, in case you don't know, was essentially the founder of dispensationalism and, and more importantly, the pre-trib rapture doctrine. It would then later be C.I. Schofield who would really uh, take these ideas and, and really form this whole idea of dispensationalism. But John Nelson Darby says, having thus, uh, having thus terminated the course of grace, God proposes a condition to them, the Jews. If they obeyed his voice, they should be his people. The people, instead of knowing themselves and saying, we dare not, though bound to obey, place ourselves under such a condition and risk our blessing, yea, make sure of losing it, undertake to do all that the Lord had spoken. The blessing now took the form of dependence like Adam's on the faithfulness of man as well as of God. And so he goes on to say, let's see. Terror, such is the character of the law, a rule sent out to man, which man cannot approach God, but a barrier is set up. And the question of righteousness as the way of life raised and claimed from man when man is a sinner. The church is in relationship to the Father and the Jews with Jehovah. The nation is never to enter the church. The church is a kind of heavenly economy during the rejection of the earthly people. Hey, Jeff, I'm going to give this to you. All right. All right. All right. Trying something new here. 
Maybe it's working, maybe it's not. All right. So the church is in relationship to the Father and the Jews with Jehovah. Notice that? All right, so we're still on Darby there. All right, so the church is in relationship with the Father and the Jews with Jehovah. The Jewish nation is never to enter the church, the church, a kind of heavenly economy during the rejection of the earthly people. Whoa. This isn't right. This is the whole basis of the dispensational model. In case you didn't know, a lot of people never heard of dispensationalism. A lot of dispensationalists have never heard of dispensationalism, ironically. All right. And again, I don't want to get bogged down in theology. I just want to give you enough just so that you understand how did we get here? How did the stage look so weird? Okay, why is it that some people believe this and we believe this? I mean, so you have to understand some of these things in the background, all right? And next week we're going to get into the book of Romans. But again, as a preamble to understand what happened. We need to understand some of these concepts. So it was Darby who, who one of the, well, certainly it was Marcion, but then Darby followed in those footsteps to make this big wall of separation between the church and between Israel. Schofield, his false claim, law versus grace. He says, concerning Israel and the church in origin, calling, promise, worship, principles of conduct and future destiny, all is contrast. Do you hear that? All is contrast. What? He says the fourth dispensation promise ended, ready, when Israel rashly accepted the law. What? No. So dispensationalists believe that there are seven dispensations. There was an age of innocence, and then there was an age of conscious. Um, conscience, and then there was an age of the patriarchs of Abraham, and then there was the age of law. They only really care about two ages, okay? There's the age of law from Moses until the cross, and that was called the age of law, and then there was, the, then there's the age of grace. We're in the age of grace right now. Isn't it great to be in the age of grace? I mean, gosh, glad we're not in the age of law. Wouldn't that be a bummer? Right? Now again, so it's this dichotomy that many pastors, Baptist pastors, um, there's a whole slew of them who, 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 give, who uh, subscribe to this basic idea. So Israel rashly accepted the law. He says, grace had prepared a deliverer, Moses, provided a sacrifice for the guilty, and divine power had brought them out of bondage. But at Sinai, they exchanged grace for law. What? What do you mean they exchanged grace for law? That is so not true. They did not exchange grace for law. And yet this is the, uh, the, the underlying factor, the hidden variable in many people's theology, and they don't even realize it. They're teaching these things. They're espousing these things. They're repeating these things. They don't understand where it's come from. It's come from Marcion. Made popular by John Nelson Darby and C.I. Schofield. And so um, we have to understand here that no, this was uh, God's grace did not end at Sinai. And the law did not begin at Sinai. We've talked about the word law, the word Torah. It comes from the word yara, it means to shoot. We also get uh, the word more out of that same word, which is to teach or to instruct. God's instructions or his law, his instructions are simply his values communicated to us. And we saw that Abraham was keeping those commandments. He was keeping God's Torah, God's instructions, because God's instructions are good. They're good for us. That's why we want to follow them. And I tell you, the closer we get to them, the more freedom you have. It's, it's a lie of the enemy that God's commandments are bad, that they're against us, that they're somehow, you know, working contrary to us. And Jesus had to come and save us from the law. That's why we saw those memes I showed you at the beginning where you saw that somehow, <coughs> supposedly, God's law was bad. 
It's awful. It's terrible. And yet, many of our Christian brothers hold to that idea. He goes on to say, grace is therefore constantly set in contrast to law, under which, well, it's Schofield, yeah, uh, under which God demands righteousness from man. Under grace, he gives righteousness to man. Law is connected with Moses and works. Grace with Christ and faith. Law blesses the good. Grace saves the bad. Law demands that blessing be earned. Grace is free. Oh my goodness. Oh, I'm, in, I'm feeling sick, okay? Um, get me a bucket. I need something, right? Because this kind of teaching is so wrong. And again, I'm not here to tell you whether C.I. Schofield loved Jesus or not. Probably he did. But the, the theology that he's espousing is not his own. It goes back to this guy named Marcion. All right? And again, many, many Christians who love Jesus, etc. And tomorrow we'll celebrate his resurrection. Hallelujah. I'm glad that Jesus rose from the dead. You know, I really am. But the ideas, and they look at you funny like, why are you keeping the law? Are you trying to be Jewish? Wait, why do you keep Sabbath? I mean, don't you know the Lord did away with that? Don't you know that the law was nailed to the cross? And you're like, ah, oh, no, no. All right, and you, you say, look, look at this verse. And they're like, yeah, but, and they can't see it, guys. Because they're looking at the same verse, and what they've heard is that Paul taught something about such and such a verse, and so therefore, it doesn't mean what we think it means. Again, God demands righteousness from man. Under grace, he gives righteousness to man, right? So everything is contrast. Grace and law are two different, two different things. I think there's grace in God's commandments. I think there's grace in his commandments. I, I've heard it said, you know, when Jesus came and he, the woman caught in adultery, he just decided to be nice. He was gracious. No. God's law actually said that it takes two. Right? And if they're both caught in the act, well, then you've got something to talk about. But if only one of them is caught in the act, well, guess what? That's probably a setup. You know, it's a little birds and bees thing. Uh, talk to an adult if you need some, some education on that. But it takes two people. All right? And so you can't just catch one person in the act. It takes two people. Right? And so Jesus was simply applying the law as it was supposed to be done. He wasn't saying, well, lucky for you, I came along and I'm just nice. And I'm not going to follow my own commandments. No, of course he was going to follow his own commandments. Because that's who he is. Ellis uh, Chafer says that God has two purposes. The dispensationalist believes God is pursuing two distinct purposes. One related to the earth with earthly people, the Jews, and earthly objectives involved, which is Judaism, while the other is related to heaven with heavenly people and heavenly objectives involved, which is the church. Okay, now which one do you want to be? Do you want to be part of the earth with all the earthly stuff, or do you want to be part of heaven and all the heavenly stuff? Oh, come on, give me an amen, right? Of course you want to be part of the church. You want to be part of the heavenly stuff. We don't want to go back to that earthly stuff. That's crazy. And yet this is, uh, he was the, the, um, one of the early presidents of Dallas Theological Seminary that trains many, many great teachers, mind you. Great teachers. I've studied under many of these, many of these men, and I, I, I thank God for their good instruction. But when it comes to this topic, it's messed up. He says the church is a new heavenly purpose of God absolutely disassociated from both Jew and Gentile. Oh. Oh. So if you were here two weeks ago when I was talking how God is bringing the kingdom back together, right, this is, uh, we've called it um, commonwealth theology. Uh, some people think of it like two houses. Depends how you want to call it. But basically what God is doing is he's putting the house of Israel and the house of Judah back together. Uh, Ezekiel talks about this. The two sticks, right? They're going to not be two nations in his hand anymore. They're going to be one nation, one stick. Never again to be two nations. Chafer asked the following questions. Why two companies are redeemed in the New Jerusalem? Hey guys, there aren't. 
There aren't. There's only one people in the new Jerusalem. You know who it is? It's the bride. You know who the bride is? It's Israel. It's Israel. You know how I know that? Oh, I don't know, because there's like 12 gates, and all the gates are about the different, you know, the different tribes. Maybe that's how I know. All right? There's no church door. There's no Gentile door to come into the New Jerusalem. You got to pick one. You can go through Judah or Issachar or Simeon. You can go through Manasseh and Ephraim. You're going to go through these different doors. Which one? There's no Gentile door. Right? So there's not, there's not two different things. Uh, why only earthly promises to Israel and only heavenly promises to the church? Okay, another newsflash. There aren't. This is completely false. And yet this is the dichotomy that so many of our, our well-meaning brothers and sisters who teach the, teach the Bible, it's because they've been... Uh, They've bought into this whole idea of this kind of haunted theology that this stolen identity thanks to Marcion. Why is Israel likened to the repudiated and yet to be restored wife of Jehovah and the church likened to this espoused bride of Christ? Again, they're not. This is completely false teaching. It's completely false. They are one. You see, God has one Right. Now, I've heard some great teachers, uh, very educated, very erudite, right? So, uh, and I, I'm sure they love Jesus. But teaching that God has his, a wife, Israel, who was, as Chafer says, this repudiated wife, this adulterous wife, who's gone and cheated on her husband. That's Jehovah's the father's God, or father's bride, or wife. But Jesus, oh, he gets this beautiful new bride, pure and spotless, white. So wait a second. So God the Father has a wife, and Jesus has a wife? Is this what you're saying? Yes. That is what they're saying. That is what they're saying. That God the Father He's got his woman. Jesus has his woman. And I guess they're going to be separate forever. You're like, really? Seriously? Yes. So much for that wall of separation coming down. Oh, no, we're going to build it higher. We're going to make the, the wall higher. Now, Charles Ryrie, I used to teach out of this very book. Okay? It's called Basic Theology. I used to teach out of this book. Again, good book. He says, the dispensationalist keeps Israel and the church distinct. The church is a distinct body in this age, having promises and a different destiny from Israel's. No. No, 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 no. Guys, we are not here on the Sabbath. We're not keeping Passover and all these other things, eating clean because we're trying to be Jews. We think it's because we're now part of Israel. Do you see the difference? And we're not saying we're replacing Israel. We're not saying, oh, well, God's done with them. Now he's with us, and we're going to call ourselves Israel. We're not doing that either. That's called replacement theology. We are not into that. And when I was growing up, I thought there were two basic choices, dispensationalism or replacement theology. And replacement theology seemed wrong because it's like, wait, why are you getting rid of the Jews? Why, why do they not have any purpose anymore? So uh, dispensationalism seemed like the right choice. But as I continue to say, I'm like, wait a second, this isn't right either. And so there's something in the middle. We call it commonwealth theology. That's what we teach here at the Way Congregation. We've discovered, though it's been in the Bible the whole time, but that we are part of Israel. We're grafted into Israel. You don't have to be Jewish. We're not trying to be Jewish. If you're Jewish, hallelujah. It's great. But most of us are non-Jews, a.k.a. Gentiles. But what does Paul say about them? He says that you are no longer strangers from the covenants and the promises. You're now fellow citizens. You're part of the commonwealth of Israel. And so, thank you. So Ryrie goes on to say, the law was never given to Gentiles and is expressly done away for the Christians. Oh! Chalk, you know, fingernails, chalkboard. How does he get this idea? Well, again, I can understand how you could get there. I can understand how you could get there. But 
But keep this in mind that when, when God divorced the northern kingdom, the ten tribes, where did they go? Into the Gentiles. What did God say to them? Hey, you're not my people anymore. Lo a me. You're not my people. You're not my people. And if you're not God's people, what are you? You're just part of the general stock. You're just part of humanity. If you're not God's people, you're just one of all the Gentiles. So God divorced the northern kingdom of Israel and he said, you're not mine anymore. We're like not a thing anymore. You're over there. I'm over here. I'm not your God. You're not my people. I'm not your husband. You're not my wife. But one day, Israel, behold, the days are coming when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them. But this is the covenant they'll make in those days that I'll write my law on their hearts and put it in their minds. Right? My, put my Torah in there. That's what God has been talking about. And yet we missed it. We missed it roughly for the last 2,000 years. Uh, this is from Doctrine.org who says, Jesus preached the kingdom of heaven. Paul did not. Paul preached justification by faith alone. Jesus did not. The messages of Jesus and Paul were fundamentally different. Sorry, I have to say that. I'm just quoting. Reconciliation of their messages cannot be done by harmonization. Oh, Again, I kind of feel cringy. Like, oh, this is just bad stuff. Two different gospels, huh? And yet this is what so many people believe. So this is why you might feel flustered if you've ever had a conversation. You're like, well, can't you see it, brother? It's right here. And Paul himself even says it. They're like, yeah, but I don't see it. Because they can't. Because they've got their Marcion glasses on and they cannot see what you're actually saying. Uh, that same, web, same website goes on to say, Paul emphasized the church the body of Christ. This terminology was entirely absent from the teaching of Jesus and the twelve and unknown until the ascended Lord revealed it to Paul. It was new. Peter, James, John, Jude, etc. did not teach it and knew nothing of it until they learned it from Paul. Okay, so let me get this straight. Jesus, the greatest teacher ever, right? He spends, you know, three plus years with these disciples. They're walking around Israel all the time, Judea. They're talking about Torah. They're talking about all this different stuff. Jesus does teaching after teaching. He feeds the 5,000. He walks on water. He does all this stuff. He says, watch out for the Leaven of the Pharisees, and he's teaching his 12 disciples all this stuff about his kingdom. And he dies, and he rises, and so now the 12, you know, minus one, he's replaced by Matthias. And yet, they didn't know anything about this doctrine until Jesus revealed it when Paul was going to Damascus, and that's when Paul got this download of this new gospel. Is that what you're trying to tell me? Is that what I'm to believe? Yes, that's what they want us to believe. And this is not fringy stuff, guys. This is mainstream stuff. And they think that we're weird. But this stuff is crazy. This is what they're teaching. None of them knew about it. You know, I think if this were true, this would make Jesus the worst communicator ever. This would make him the worst teacher I'm going to spend three plus years teaching you guys all kinds of stuff, but none of it's going to matter for the church. None of it's going to be, for the next 2,000 years, all that I teach you is kind of irrelevant. And it'll be Paul. It'll be Paul who will give the truth to the church. So I kind of wasted my time. That's essentially what they're saying. I mean, that's what they're saying. I have more quotes for you. Don't believe me? Paul alone revealed and taught that the citizenship and position of believers in the body of Christ was heavenly, not earthly. For Paul, God's kingdom as related to the body of Christ was heavenly and wholly different from the earthly kingdom proclaimed by John the Baptist, Jesus, and the twelve. Oh my goodness. I'm starting to feel weak. 
All right, Doug Stauffer, in his book, One Book, Rightly Divided, he says that Paul is the church's only apostle, just like Marcion did. He says, is God's direction for us today found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, or in Hebrews? God's specific directions for the church are found predominantly in the 13 epistles. Uh, okay, so of course, obviously, that belong to Paul, right? He goes on to say, Jesus preached the kingdom of, excuse me, the gospel of the kingdom. He instructed his apostles and disciples to preach the same gospel. Ready? No Bible-believing preacher today preaches the gospel of the kingdom. Well, Doug Stauffer, I'm going to teach the gospel of the kingdom. Because that's what my king was teaching. Jesus came preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. That's what he kept preaching. Now, only at the very end did he talk about his death, burial, and resurrection. Now, to be very clear, guys, I think the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is supremely important. Okay? Very important. But that's like the doorway to a gorgeous mansion. How do you get in? Through the door. But you're not going to live in the door. The door is really important. Because that's how you go from outside to inside into the kingdom. And so the cross is the door. But we're not going to live in the door. We're going to go inside into the living room, in the kitchen, and the bedrooms, and we're going to enjoy the kingdom. That's what we're getting at here. So no Bible-believing preacher today preaches the gospel of the kingdom. Well, I'm accepted. He preaches instead the gospel of the grace of God. No, actually, it's the Marcionistic pastors that teach that. There's a big difference in their main message. The former talks of a king reigning, while the latter speaks about trusting in the Savior who, was sacrificed, who sacrificed himself by shedding his blood. The kingdom gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, will go back into effect after the church age, a.k.a. the rapture, the preacher of rapture. Whew. Yeah, okay. Um, he's got more. Doug Stauffer says, if it contradicts Paul's teachings, it cannot be church age doctrine. Ooh, wow. He says, the key to application, so long as the particular scriptures do not contradict the Apostle Paul's explicit instructions to the church, they can have church age application. Our spokesman is the Apostle Paul. Whether the particular truth presented elsewhere uh, contradicts the plain teaching of the Apostle Paul to the church, if it contradicts his teachings, it cannot be church age doctrine. So, okay. It's funny, you know. We went through the book of, of uh, John. In the beginning was Paul. No, no, something wrong with that, right? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word became flesh, right? And the Word was Jesus. So the Word walked among us. He taught us. He was teaching us God's heart. But it turns out that was all just for nothing. That was an exercise in futility because it was really Paul that we need to listen to. Now again, if you... If you if you start to wake up to this whole idea, like, wait, Marcion's not right, then you start thinking, well, Paul isn't right. And this is why some people in the Torah, Hebrew roots, Messianic community start saying, I'm, I'm done with Paul. I don't want Paul. This is what happens. Because they start to, they're like, wait, this doesn't add up. But it's not Paul who is the problem. It's the Marcionistic lens that Paul is taught through. That's the problem. You see the difference? Paul's great. And I'm going to spend lots of time in the book of Romans showing you how Paul was a genius and how Paul got it. And he's like, do you guys not see this stuff? Don't you see how God's putting the two sticks back together? It's brilliant. And yet it's been lost. And I would admit, I'll confess, that I did not see it for a very long time either. I did not see it. 
You know, it's interesting. I, I, so I used to work at Calvary Chapel. I was a pastor at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, under um, the direction of Pastor Chuck Smith. Maybe some of you have known him. Great guy. I learned a lot from Pastor Chuck Smith. There was this, uh, this anti-missionary woman who would call the church, and her job was to confound pastors. All right? And so she would call and just ask all these hard questions. And so the other pastors were like, hey, Doug, we got this woman who keeps calling us. We don't know what to say to her. She's Israeli. Can you help us out? I'm like, sure. So they passed her to me. So whenever she would call the church, they're like, hold on. And they would forward her to me. And I told her, I said, look, you can call me. I'll never call you, but you can call any time you want. And so we talked for years. Probably four or five years we talked. She would call me just all the time with all these questions. And what's so amazing is by the, by the end of our talk, she began to believe that Yeshua was the Messiah. I was like, yes, right? But I remember this one day, we were, we were talking about stuff, and I was like, well, you Jews, you don't, you know, you're just trying to keep the law to, to earn favor with God. She's like, no, we're not. I'm like, yes, you are. You don't even know your own theology. You're just trying to do the law to earn God's favor. She's like, no. She said, we do it because God told us to. And it was like this light bulb went off in my brain. And I was like, a sword went through my heart. I'm like, what? You do it because God told you to? And it was at that point I realized, I'm like, wait a second, something's wrong with my theology. I thought it was all her theology that was off. But my theology was off. Because I began to realize, if God told you to keep the commandments, and he did, who am I to tell you to not keep them? And that's when I began to question, wait a second, why don't I keep Sabbath? Why do I eat pork? Why don't I keep the feasts? And why do I think that the Torah, the, the law, has been done away with? It was these things that really started to get in under my skin. So it was Arrhenius who said that Marcion sta uh, started with the radical view that the church's teachings must conform to the gospel of Paul. Marcion said this. You see, Marcion, <laughs> yeah, he, um, he thought that only Paul had it right. Okay, only Paul. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, eh. I mean, interesting stuff, historical stuff about Jesus, sure. But as far as the teachings, eh. Arrhenius goes on. Marcionites allege that Paul alone knew the truth and that to him the mystery was manifested by revelation. Did we not just see that in Doug Stauffer's book? And again, I'm not trying to throw Doug Stauffer under the book. I'm sure he loves Jesus. Hallelujah. But his teaching about Paul and Marcion is a little bit weird. And uh, it was really Marcion who literally used the knife. Now, in, in dispensational circles, they love to use this whole thing of that you need to rightly divide the word of truth, okay? It's taken from 2 Timothy, right? A workman who need not be ashamed who rightly divides the word of truth. And that, that's great. But Marcion took this to the, to the um, nth degree where he literally took a knife to a scroll or a text and he cut out the pieces of the biblical text he didn't like. That's a bit radical. <laughs> now, no Christian would do that today. Of course not. They'll just ignore them. Or they'll just say, well, that's not for us. That was for, that was for the Jews. And you're like, what about all the teachings of Jesus? Yeah, that was before the cross. Like, so you're, what you're telling me then is anything that Jesus taught before the cross isn't for me? No. Nope. No. Nope. No. Nope. Only after the cross. Because you see, the law of grace, the law of grace started with Moses. And when did it end? At the cross. And so we're not under the, the age of law. We're in the age of grace. Man, age of grace is good. Right? But, but this is the teaching, that all those things that Jesus himself, the Word made flesh, God walking among us, Emmanuel was teaching, those don't directly apply to me. Sort of indirectly, kind of. So Marcion expressly and openly used the knife, not the pen, since he made such an excision of the Scriptures as suited his own subject matter. 
I've heard this sermon before. Oh my goodness. I've heard it many times. Um, so this is uh, taken from uh, a man named Timothy. Um, he is a Marcion disciple in my humble opinion. He says, only a relatively small portion of the Bible applies doctrinally to church age Gentiles. Okay. From Acts chapter 15 to Philemon, which are of course Paul's books, applies doctrinally to, born, to a born again Christian and is unique to the church age. The rest of the Bible is strictly Jewish. We must be careful to rightly divide the scriptures where doctrine is concerned. Now again, these guys believe the Bible. They think it's all, you know, God's word. It's just that most of it doesn't really apply to me. Sure, God said it, but he said it to the Jews, not to me. And so therefore it has no application to me. So yeah, they don't take a literal knife like Marcion did, but they just say, well, it doesn't apply. You know, you can read it. It's interesting. Now again, here's someone. I really don't like to pick on people. That's not my style. I'm not to tell you that that Andy Stanley doesn't believe in Jesus. I'm sure he does. I'm sure he loves God. I'm sure he's, oh, I hope he's born again, and I hope to see him in the kingdom. But he made a statement that deeply concerns me. He says, first century church leaders unhitched the church from the worldview, value system, and regulations of the Jewish scriptures. That's the Old Testament. Peter, James, Paul, elected to unhitch the Christian faith from their Jewish scriptures, and my friends, we must as well. You can see right there on his screen, the Old Testament was not the go-to source regarding any behavior for the church. This is why you have those conversations that they just look at you like, what's wrong with you? Are you trying to be Jewish? You're like, no, I'm not trying to be Jewish. I just want to do whatever that God has said to do. Uh, Albert Moeller, Jr., president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, he says, to be clear, Andy Stanley does not endorse the full heresy of Marcionism, which was universally condemned by the early church. He actually appears to aim for the heresy of Marcionism, and his hearers are certainly aimed in that direction. So, the full heresy of Marcionism was to say that there was a different God of the Old Testament and a other God of the New Testament. Of course, it was the God of the New Testament who was the real, true God. And the God of the Old Testament was this demiurge kind of people's God. You know, that, that God, he was kind of mean because you know what he did? He came up with this thing called the law. And then he foisted it on the backs of people. Here, take that. Try that out for a couple of thousand years and see what happens. So he clearly says that God is the same God in both Testaments, but says that he reveals himself in two completely different ways. Just like Marcion, he argues that the church must unhitch from the Old Testament. So there you have it. It's not on my authority, but it's on this guy. Okay? Joseph Prince, very popular, says you cannot put grace and law together. The law is not for you, the believer, who's been made righteous in Christ. The law is not applicable to someone who is under the new covenant of grace. Ooh. Okay, so let's compare Marcion's theology versus biblical theology. According to Marcion's theology, the law was done away with. But according to the Bible, the law is eternal. Uh, there's a disjunction between law and grace under Marcion, whereas biblical theology says that there's harmony between law and grace. Marcion's theology, the Jews and the church are two different entities, but in biblical theology, the Jews and the church are two sticks or trees that are coming back together. It was Marcion who coined terms like New Testament and Old Testament. Been wondering where do we get those terms? From Marcion. But according to biblical theology, the Hebrew Bible and the apostles' writings are a continuum. The apostles did not say things contrary to the Old Testament. Neither did Paul say things contrary to the Old Testament. 
everything that they said, especially Jesus, was all grounded and rooted in the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. Jesus never, ever contradicted the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. Paul never, ever contradicted the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. Never. But Marcion teaching would have you believe that Paul was against it. The New Testament scriptures, according to Marcion, were superior to the Old Testament. But according to biblical theology, the New Testament scriptures have the same weight as the Old Testament. Number six, the gracious, law, the gracious God of the New Testament, according to Marcion, sent forth his son to free us from the bondage of the Old Testament law. This was nailed to the cross. You saw that in the meme that I started with. Biblical theology, the penalty for sin was nailed to the cross, not God's commandments. Marcion taught that Paul was the final authority in Scripture, even above Jesus. Biblically, though, God is the lawgiver and final authority. Paul is a faithful commentator. Commentator. Paul, listen, Paul had zero, zero, Ephes, nula, zilch, nada. He had no authority whatsoever to change one iota in the law. He had no authority to, to contradict God's teachings in any way. The law of Moses, God's commandments, whatever you want to call them. Zero. And he didn't. He did not contradict them. He was completely consistent with them, but he was confused. So, all right, how do we reclaim your identity? We've got to figure out how to regain what Marcion stole from our preaching, teaching, and practical living. Well, thankfully, it's not that hard. Number one, see the commandments is good. Study them. Discover that God actually has your good in mind when he gave those things. That's something, now again, I'm not here to disparage anyone who might think differently. Pray about this. I had to. When I first realized that, hey, if eating pork was not good for people back then and God was against it, I was like, maybe it's still not good. And you know, you can read all kinds of medical journals that tell you that the worst food in the world is actually pork. All right, now if you don't, if you don't have that conviction yet, that's fine. Just don't tell me, all right? Don't tell me and I won't challenge you, all right? If you want me to challenge you, come talk to me. But, you know, none of us is going to go to your house and look in your fridge and say, uh-oh, we're not going to do it, all right? So if you want to eat that in the privacy of your home, that's fine. We're not judging you. We ask you not to bring it here for Oneg, but that's fine, okay? We're not, we're not going to judge you for that. And let the, let the Lord, you know, give you some some discernment on that. Deuteronomy says, the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always that he might preserve us alive. That's why God gave us his instructions. Uh, anybody a parent in here? Anyone? All right. Did you ever tell your kids not to touch the hot stove? Did you do that because you were trying to take all the fun out of life? The reason you did that was what? Because you could have serious bodily harm if you put your hand on the stove. And when they're little, they don't know. And so your commandment, don't touch the hot stove, was good. It was very good. Now by the time they're 17 and 18, they should know. And if they touch it, well guess what? They will receive the penalty for their foolishness by burning their hand. You're like, well, I told you that wasn't good. Well, yeah, but that was so long ago. I thought it was okay now. No, fire is still fire. It still hurts. What did Paul say? 1 Corinthians 7. The law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. That's in Romans. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Number two, we need to establish doctrine from the entire Bible, not only Paul. And again, I think you can, you can read Paul with a different lens and you will see that he's very biblical. He's always completely consistent with what all of the other scriptures say, with everything that Jesus said. And if you're wondering, well, Paul seems to say something different than Jesus. Well, then take a break 
say, okay, maybe my Marcionistic glasses are confusing me here, and I'm thinking that somehow Paul is contradicting. Because I guarantee you he's not contradicting anything that the Lord said or anything that was written in the Torah. Never. It's just that Paul, he got it. And a lot of what he does in his letters is trying to tell you how the house of Judah and the house of Israel are coming back together. Now, they weren't always called the house of Israel. They're called the Gentiles. And you became part of the house of Israel as a Gentile when you believed in Yeshua. That was the door to come into the kingdom. And then you became part of the house of Israel. That was it. And so Paul's having to, you know, kind of help people understand how these two disparate groups can come back together without one of them becoming Jewish. He's like, no, 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 that's not the solution. You see, don't, don't you see that, that the house of Israel was scattered, became Gentiles? And he quotes from Hosea. He quotes from Jeremiah, these different things. So Paul tells us that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Jesus said, Do not think that I came to destroy the Torah, the prophets. Whoever does them and teaches them will be called great. And number three, walk according to his commandments. Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. That's what Abraham did long before Sinai, long before the Sinaitic covenant or the old covenant, if you will. He was already walking according to God's commandments. God is bragging on Moses. He says, hey, Abraham, excuse me, he was bragging on Abraham. Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my Torah. Torah tie. He kept my instructions. Because you see, God's instructions are timeless. Of course they're timeless. God doesn't change. His values don't change. He's not like, you know, I had these these values back then, but I'm kind of done with those. I got these new values. No. Praise God he doesn't change. Jesus says, whoever has my commandments and keeps them is he who loves me. And last I leave with uh, what Peter said about Paul. He says, be in holy conduct and godliness. Be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless as also our beloved brother Paul has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them and of these things, in which are some things hard to understand. Yes, true. So even Peter's like, you know, some of the stuff you write, Paul, is a little hard to understand. But, hard to understand, which untaught, and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do the rest of the scriptures. All right, so messianic folks who say, I don't want Paul anymore, they're untaught and they're unstable. I'm not saying they're not good humans, okay? They're probably great humans. They're good parents and all that. But they don't know what the Torah says. And so they're like, oh, Paul is bad. No, y you've kind of discovered that Paul sounds Marcionistic because that's what you've heard from preachers. But Paul himself was 100% on target. And the other folks, the dispensationalists and many others, that I, some of them that I listed, they've also missed what the Torah says. And they're suggesting that Paul was teaching something very different. Two different gospels. Two different people groups. Two different brides. Beloved, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. Be on your guard. Do not be carried away by the deception of lawless people. Lawless. John says that sin is lawlessness. Now the church has done a number of that. Because the church starts inventing new sins. You can't do that because that's a sin. Really? How do I know that? 
well, because uh, we've uh, believed that for a while. No. If you want to know if something is sin or not, go to the source, which is God, who gave the commandments, and that will tell you. And if you're fuzzy on it, study. If you're still fuzzy, study some more. And you'll begin to see, oh, loving my neighbor is not a New Testament thing. That's a Leviticus 19 thing. Oh, my goodness. Helping my enemy is not a New Testament thing. That's a Torah thing. Because if I see my enemy's ox or donkey in the ditch, I must surely help him out. Even if it's a Sabbath, I'm supposed to do these things. Why? Because it's about love. Because it's about love. Guys, I want us to start walking in God's power. I want us to have a new vision. We've got to see things differently. We've got to change. We've got to, we've got to get on board with what God is doing because God is awesome. And this is why we've, we've come up with this new, um, this new uh, vision statement. If you could bring that up, Jeff, that'd be great. Our vision, what is it we want to do? We aim to share God's kingdom of love with every soul and guide them in his instructions for life. It's not complicated. Our mission is not to get people saved, so to speak. I'm not saying there's not a place for that. But that's not really the mission. Jesus gave the great commission to go and to do what? To make disciples. Teaching them to obey all things that I've commanded you. What did he tell us? Well, God's commandments. But again, hear me please. Our mission here, our message is not Torah. We're not trying to convert people to Torah. We're not trying to convert people to Sabbath or to excising pork from their menu. That's not our mission. Our mission is to teach the kingdom of God. It's so much better. And within the kingdom, yes, there are behaviors. There's, there's a character style that we want to adopt, and that is to follow our Lord and do what he did. No more, no less. Okay? That's our goal. And so this is what we want to do, is to share God's kingdom of love. It's a great kingdom. It's not a harsh kingdom. It's not a judgmental kingdom. It's a wonderful kingdom. It's a kingdom of love, and he loves people, even people that we don't sometimes love. God loves them, and he wants us to love them too. We don't always have to agree with them, but we still have to love them. We can, we can have little debates about pronunciations and shapes and dates. We can, that's fine. But we have to love each other. That is the bedrock. That's where we have to stop. And that's where probably we probably should just stop talking about some of that stuff because it's a waste of time. We're getting so distracted by shiny little things. Ooh, look at this. And we waste our time endlessly debating genealogies and dates and shapes, all this stuff, when God's given us a commission to do something better. So we want to share his kingdom of love. That's what Jesus was doing, was preaching the good news of the kingdom with every soul, right? So we want to do that here. We want to do that online. We want to do that out in our communities, in our workplace, in our homes, wherever we can. We just want to share that. And sometimes we, we need to use words and say things, and sometimes we just need to act like Yeshua. Sometimes that's the biggest testimony you can give. So that's our vision. Um, I, I pray that you would meditate on that, adopt it. Think about how you can get involved, right? Not all the action should happen up here. A lot of action needs to happen with you guys, through you guys, by you guys. I don't have all the good ideas. Trust me, I don't. Neither does Jeff. If you guys have some great ideas, come and see us. We want to work together. That's the beautiful thing is that we're not called to go build God's kingdom individually, but corporately. We get to do this work together. It's a lot more fun. Many hands make light work. All right? And so that's, that's really our goal. That's what we're all about. So if you would please stand. Let's uh, finish with the incredible blessing. Could you? Okay. All right. Oh, God is good.